Hey friends, thanks for watching. I got a really uh, nice show and interview for you today. I have someone who's been in the business doing all kinds of different things, which we always love to hear about, but equally important, uh, this gentleman is giving back to the community, so we're gonna really split up the conversation. Let's welcome Michael, or Mike Hambright to the show. How are you doing this morning, Mike? I'm good, Michael, how are you? I'm doing very well. Why don't we just start off by introducing uh, the listeners to who you are, where you are in the country, and a little bit about what you do in the business today. Yeah. So I'm a real estate investor, uh, kind of corporate refugee, I guess. I, I didn't start here. And I, just like you, Michael, I mean, a lot of us, a lot of the most successful real estate investors that I know or in, in the industry uh, didn't come out of the womb flipping houses. Like we kind of found our way here, <laughs> usually from frustration with uh, what our other options were, right? Yeah. So, but I've been a real estate investor now for about 11 years. Um, started in 2008. And, uh, got pretty, pretty big, pretty fast in terms of volume was, was flipping, you know, um, maybe 70 houses a year for a while and then started mentoring and coaching people that ultimately, so we're, we're doing thousands of houses a year and, um, and it's kind of evolved from there just, uh, as the market shifts and as I see new opportunities to kind of serve other people and do things that I enjoy doing, I just kind of shift with it. Very cool. So let's go back to 2008 cause that's a, that's an interesting time to start. Yeah, yeah. We were kind of like mid crash in 2008, or was it right at the peak? It was. Uh, it was starting to slow down. Now I'm in. So I'm in Dallas, um, okay. and primarily my most of my investing activities have been here. Uh, and so you know there wasn't like a huge crash here. There definitely was a slowdown. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is uh, you know my my so my wife and I work in the business together. We. Have, uh, in fact, we're the only two people in our office today. A lot of our folks are, are virtual and some of our staff that works in the office here works uh, from uh, home on uh, two days a week. So anyway, um, you know, it was just coincidence, the timing. Like we, based on where we were with losing jobs and moving around the country and stuff before we got into real estate investing, it just was coincidence, the timing. Like we didn't plan it. In fact, everybody thought we were crazy for starting <laughs> at that time. But of course, in hindsight, it was a great time to get in. And uh you know, I wish we knew now what we knew then, of course. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that's how life goes. There you go. Well, you know, b being ready for the next opportunity is not a bad thing either, right? Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. I, I definitely have, uh, you know, I, I hate to I, I hate to say things that kind of age me, but I, I definitely <laughs> have, have picked up some wisdom along the years, uh, mostly of what not to do, right? And uh, Or when to do those things. Like, hey, that's perfect, but the market's not ready for that yet or whatever right. it might be, right? Yeah, yeah. So 2008. So it sounded like in your little run there, you actually started full time, right? You lost some jobs or moved around. The yeah, country. yeah. I mean, the 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 uh, I I always have a hard time with a short version of the story, but basically, I I uh, I went to college to um, uh, in finance. I, my my degree was in finance, and I really wanted to work in investments. I had no. I was the first person in my family to go to college, so I didn't even know what the heck that meant, but. <laughs> I liked, I liked the idea of making money and investing and I was interested in what, kind of investing in the stock market, right? I, I had no idea what yeah. that even meant, but there. effectively <laughs> I, I got out of college and I became effectively a, a glorified auditor. Like it was just a really, worked for a very large bank where it kind of felt sexy, like, you know, it was a huge, huge bank and uh, I had to wear a suit to work and so I kind of feel important in all those things and I'm like, hey, this this actually sucks. Like this is not, is this really all, all there is, you know? And so, um, then I, I moved to Dallas, that was from Chicago. I moved to Dallas in 1999, a couple of years after my, my being the, working for this bank and went to work for a large retailer, Neiman Marcus actually, which has a lot of sex appeal. Right. But I effectively got an auditor role again and they like the accounting and finance people. They, they literally put us in a different building, like 10 <laughs> blocks away from all the sexy stuff. So it's like you kind of weirdos like go over there, you know? And, uh, you know, it's just, it's like I'm in all these jobs where, and in that job, you know, there were like, I was an analyst, financial analyst and there were two of us and we had one boss and then that guy had a counterpart and those two people had one boss. And it's like, I could literally see the next like 20 years of my career within like 20 yards of me right now. Yeah. Is that really what I want to do? And the answer was no. And so I thought, Hey, I need more formal education. Right. And, uh, so went back to grad school and got an MBA at a top school and everything was great. And then the market that was 2000, we started in 2001 and we came out in 2003. So the market 
basically about a month into our program, which is where I met my wife, by the way, but uh, about a month into that program, 9-11 happened. Yeah. And so the market took a downturn. So here I am going into this grad school program thinking I'm coming out, I'm going to be working on Wall Street or working for a big investment bank or you know, McKinsey or somebody like that and just writing my own check to where um, you know, half of my class graduated with no job yeah. because the market had just shifted, right? And so, yeah, I remember. And uh, anyway, got a good job and was flying high for a couple of years and then this company with 35,000 employees effectively doesn't exist anymore just went away and uh, then I went to another company and then after a couple of years they filed bankruptcy and it's like these lessons of like I played the game the way they told me to play the game and I have no control right and so it was that that culmination of all those activities and then uh, about a, a two months before I left that company that filed bankruptcy I didn't have to leave but kind of the writing was on the wall you know mm -hmm. um, my son was born and my wife had left her job and she had a better paying job than I did and it's like okay this, this whole corporate America thing isn't quite working or I feel like I have zero control. So I need to, I need to, I need to kind of take this into my own hands, which sounds easy enough. Of course, uh, you know, the next few years of figuring that out were uh, a lot of hard work for sure. But, um, but that's where we were 2008. Like, yeah. do I go get another J O B working for somebody else only to allow this to happen again? And who knows a year yeah. or five years, or do I take the bull by the horns myself? Well, that's, you know, that's important, right? We, we age ourselves with our stories, but you strip away the years. I could see, you know, that event happening probably somewhere between nine and 19 months, right? This economy is going to shift, right? We're not going to stay right. below 4% unemployment forever. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there will be a business cycle and there will be individuals, men and women who are, you know, who get tired. I like the uh, corporate refugee comment from earlier. Yeah. It's just, that's how it feels like, right? We go to, we, we do what we're supposed to do. Say I did the same thing. First person to go to college, then got an MBA. And it's like, is this what life is? Right. Just punching a clock. And I did a sales tax audit once on disk drives. I'm like, I am never doing this again. <laughs> that sounds sexy. Oh, it's, oh, it's horrible. <laughs> so, uh, I totally get that. So you, you, you make the call, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't like having zero control. Uh, I'm right. suspecting that you had a hundred percent backing from your wife in this, uh, this instance to make this jump. Yeah. I mean, my wife has always been very supportive, but you know, there were, there definitely were times where there's this, there's a, some lessons you have to learn to be an entrepreneur. I've always been entrepreneurial. Right. Right. But when you realize like, and, and I'm not, um, you know, I, I think there are kind of like seasons in your life and your career. And now I'm at a point where I don't have to work as hard as I used to, but I, I still do, but I don't have to, you know, I just, I yeah. love what I do. And, um, and then it was like, no, I had, I had to make it work. Like failure wasn't an option. And probably early on, honestly, there were some, there was a lot of tension. I mean, I have a great relationship with my wife, but there was just a lot of tension in that if we don't, if we don't kill something, we don't eat, you know, yeah. and we're kind of, we had some savings saved up cause we had pretty good paying corporate jobs, but we were, living on that, just burning through that quickly, plus business startup costs yeah. and all sorts of other things. And so, you know, there definitely was a time where um, things were stressful, a little more, a little more stressful for sure. And yeah. now it's not that I don't have stress in my life, but it's a different kind of stress. It's like, I don't have to worry about eating anymore, paying the bills or yeah. all those things. It's now I have more people that I'm accountable to or in for, I guess, because I, I, uh, you know, I manage these communities uh, of people that I care for and I want what's best for them. And so it's, I guess maybe it's more about other people now than me. Yeah. Uh, no question. And, and he's not just saying that people, I've seen what he's been doing out there and, and know some people that are in the groups and they're all very uh, complimentary to yourself and investor fuel. So you should be proud of that fact. Yeah, um, it's cool. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting, I don't know how to explain what we do now other than it's uh it's different than anything else that I'm aware of. I mean, it's easy to say I do coaching and I have a real estate mastermind, but it's more than that. It's, it's a, a little, it's more of a family, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I would, given the feedback I've been given, I'd say that's a fair word, uh, yeah. tagline or, or whatever you like. And we got a whole bunch of dysfunctional family members too. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, I might be one of them. Yeah. Well, clearly, clearly you are. <laughs> that's funny. So um, I know a lot of people are going to hear this story and, and go, they're going to say something like, that's where I am right? Right on the cusp or maybe just made the decision. 
So yeah. why don't we why don't we flash back if you don't mind to that first year, right? The startup costs, the you know, talk about the first deal. When did it kind of feel like a wise decision? Because I'm sure there was days, weeks, if not months, where it was the stress was building until you killed something and you ate. Right. Yeah, it was. It took us almost four months to buy our first house, and and then when we did, we actually got two houses on the same day. Oh, nice. Um, and that's kind of how this business is, right? It's feast. It's especially if you're wholesaling and rehabbing, and as you probably know, even when you're accumulating rentals, like there, you're not making much money now. Like it's it's down the road after you start to pay down some debt and things like that, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, so it's it's very much a feast or famine business until you. I kind of think of this business as a stair step approach. Like if you, if you never get off the first stair, even if you're like, let's just call that doing a deal a month. Yeah. Like that's probably not enough to hire uh, an admin or like a, an acquisitions manager, a salesperson. And so you're doing everything yourself. And you know, it's kind of Gary V says you're, you might be working your face off. And the truth is, is you need to, and kind of back to the seasons of your life. Like I, the goal is, is for me and I'm sure for you and, and probably most people that want to get into real estate is never to work your face off. Like that shouldn't be the yeah. goal, right? No, but you might have to for a couple of years until you get up on the second or third step and then things start to get a little bit easier, if you will. So yeah, I think, you know, we're around a lot of people that are, are where I was when I started and we try to help them understand those lessons that, Hey, this business ultimately, it depends on what your goals are individually. Like I don't presuppose that everybody wants to be like me or, that everybody wants to do a hundred houses a year or more or whatever. Cause that, that some people that want that don't really understand how much effort that is. Yeah. Yet. Um, but the goal is generally for most people not to be self-employed. And so you got to get, you got to get up a couple notches where the business can support itself and can support some people that can help you in your business. So. Yeah. So let's talk, everybody likes to talk about the first deals. Why don't you just, you know, high level what, those first two houses you got on the same day. I'm guessing yeah. they were wholesale deals, but maybe not. One was a wholesale and one was a rehab. It's funny because okay. I, I just did an event here in my market in Dallas and I walked everybody through it because a lot of people always ask, oh, you've been doing this for a long time. You probably don't even remember your first deal. And I was like, well, I don't, I don't know if I remember my first kiss, but I do remember my first deal. So, because <laughs> uh, yeah. it took me four months to get it, right? I'm stressed about this. Yeah. So, it was, uh, it was one of the nastiest houses to this day. We've bought some like disgusting houses over the years and this was still one of the roughest ones. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know the story goes like this. It was, it was definitely a bit of a hoarder house, lots of trash in there, really, really bad foundation issues, which foundation issues are somewhat typical in the North Texas market where I'm at. Yeah. But, but this one was like front of the house to the back of the house and maybe a 1600 square foot house, just a basic kind of three, two, two yeah. dropped like nine inches from the oh, front to the back, which is probably like uh, maybe over the course of like 40 feet you know, drop like yeah. nine inches. So in fact, the slab was kind of cracked in half. You could like see cracks. You could kind of stick your arm in, but wow. Um, so it was, you know, not what I tell most people like, don't, don't do your first rehab like that. Like it's a little more complicated, but, yeah. but you know, we kind of made every error you could make. Like we tried to wholesale it and then a, somebody backed out because we didn't ask for enough money down and they didn't really have a lot of skin in the game. So you kind of learn these lessons all along the way. And uh, then we're like, well, it's just the foundation's so bad. Let's just fix that. And maybe that'll bring more people in. And in the course of fixing that, we found out that it was going to cost more to fix the plumbing associated with the house under the house yeah. after we fixed the foundation work. And so that was a lesson. And we were out of town when the plum, the plumber, I didn't have any, I was finding all these people on my own. I didn't have like a network to say, here's exactly who to use for these things, you know? So I'm, I'm getting kind of taken advantage of without really knowing what to do, but um, and, uh, so it was, uh, not, it was not a, it was a pretty heavy rehab. I wouldn't advise people doing one that heavy on the first deal, but, uh, but the truth is, is, uh, you know, the other kind of lesson there, and I tell this story, uh, when I talk, I told the story the other day is that this house was like, you couldn't even see the house. It was covered with Ivy and weeds and it was just like, you know, yeah. uh, the stereotypical, like just abandoned house. And, uh, I met the neighbor right up front and she had just had her elderly parents move in with her. In fact, her, her father just had a stroke. Mm. So she kind of moved in with her and she made some comment that, you know, it's been a little bit of a struggle having them this close. I, I wish I could find a place in the neighborhood for them. And uh, so I could be nearby, but just not like with me, you know? Yeah. And I was like, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to rehab this house. And she was just like jaw fell on the floor. Like I would never 
let my parents live in that house. And, and I'm thinking, well, it's going to be like new again without even knowing what that meant. Cause I never yeah. rehabbed the house before. And long story short, um, you know, as, uh, we rehabbed the house, the parents started, the parents who probably had nothing to do every day would walk over there every day and just see what's going on. And they ended up, as soon as we finished the house, they ended up paying cash uh, for the house and moving in. It was, it was literally like a brand new house, you know, Nice. but, uh, it's just kind of funny. Uh, the, I guess the lesson in that story is that sometimes people as real estate investors, we have a vision sometimes for what something can become. And a lot of people don't really see that or understand that. And I guess you could use the analogy of that house, even for what we do with our careers, right? Like people yeah. are just like, you're going to do what? Like, how does that make sense? Like you're going to give up your insurance and you're going to, you know, uh, you're going to take all these risks, kind of perceived risks. And so anyway. Yeah, that's very cool. So, um, how long did that rehab take? So you locked up the deal four months, but you certainly didn't sell it right away. Yeah. Well, we did sell it. Uh, the re so the, yeah, yeah. The rehab probably at that time, you know, probably took, I bet you that took us, uh, maybe eight weeks. Oh, okay. Just now good. we rehab houses in like three weeks, even with major foundation like that, maybe four. But, um, at the time, you know, I'm, uh, I'm going to home Depot to pick out every light fixture and faucet yeah. and stuff like that. And of course, I haven't done that in many, many years now. I hardly even go to my rehabs anymore. So, but I didn't know that at the time. Like sure. it's just those lessons learned about how inefficient we will, you know, we start off and um, then you got to turn into a business eventually. Yep. Right. So let's take it up that curve, right? So you start in 2008, first couple of deals, you're doing everything. You're clearly working in your business. How yep. does it, how does it evolve? Or do you call out a couple of big inflection points uh, in your business? Yeah. I mean, we did, um, we started doing pretty quickly. Honestly, in our first year, we, we ended up buying about 65 houses. Six, this uh, is 08. Oh, oh this was a uh, kind of, this is probably like calendar year 09. Cause I okay. started in basically August of 08. Oh, I got you. And, uh, okay. We got our first deal in, in like November or something like that. So kind of 09, probably about 65 houses. And we just, wow, five a month. You no, know, we just, we, we kind of, like I said, we left corporate America. We had, um, I guess we had that corporate mentality of like, Hey, we're going to go big or go home. Okay. And, uh, and we just got after it and definitely made some mistakes along the way. But, uh, that volume allowed us to bring on staff and yep. really kind of scale things. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we probably did about 50%. Uh, let's say this 40% rehab, 40% wholesale and kind of maybe 10 or 20, 10 or 20% keeping as rentals. Okay. So, um, and now in hindsight, I wish I, from 09 to 012, I, we kept a lot of rentals during that time, but I wish we had like 10 X to that somehow, yeah. you know, <laughs> that, that turned out to be a really good time to add rentals. <laughs> yeah. 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 We have houses that we paid like sub 24 that are worth like 120 to 150. Now it's like, I wish I could, I wish I had a mulligan for that. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's. Thankfully, that's one thing we got right is uh, I, every, every book I read about investors that were investing during the, you know, the savings and loan crisis, the oil fiasco in the 70s was they always wish they bought more. So yeah. we bought everything we could. I don't have anything below 20. I have one in the 20s and, and lots of them in the 30s. Um, thankfully, we bought everything we could. I was willing to mortgage my car to buy more property. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So again, you start adding staff right away. Um, what does that team grow to at its peak? How many, how many people did you have? So uh, at its peak, we've really had kind of two acquisitions people and two admins in our office. Okay. And then pretty early on, I didn't really know a lot of people using these yet. I guess my first couple of years, I, I didn't really network a lot. Like I, I was really kind of a lone wolf, you know, because we were yep. working so hard. And at that point, honestly, I, I didn't, uh, I guess I felt like everybody was my competitor. Like I, I'm very, I feel very, very differently about that now, but sure. at the time I just, uh, you know, I guess some of it was like for my family and for us getting started, it was a little bit of, I don't want to say, I mean, I, we were not ever destitute or like living out of cardboard boxes or our car or anything like that. And I honestly, I know people that have done that and they're very successful now, but from in our own little way, we kind of were hitting bottom. Like we kind of went through this depression of like, yep leaving corporate America, got to make this work. I got a new family. You know, I didn't, my son is, uh, he's about to turn 12 here in a couple of months. And I'm not sure that I understand this parenting thing yet, but I, I certainly didn't understand it when he was like a year old or two months old, you know, it's just like, I have to, I, I like kind of shit kind of got real for me. Like yeah. I went from, 
my wife and I having no cares in the world to like, I have to be the breadwinner and supporter of everything we do here. And, um, so, you know, we kind of went through, uh, our own little mini depression and had to like come out the other side. And, and when we did, I guess I was just so focused on myself and my family and my business that I didn't, I thought anybody that I would talk to or about my business would take my secret sauce. The truth is I had no secret sauce other than just working hard, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, I think we all go through it and I see you beating yourself up a little bit for it and you know, a little bit's okay, but you know, uh, I went through the same thing. I I tell people all the time, the first five or 10 years of my career, I thought, I I thought the same way. It was, it it was kind of a win or lose mentality and uh, I didn't want to lose. Right. So, uh, but that's clearly not how I feel today. I mean, if the one thing I'm playing with is, is actually opening an office in my market, which I don't live in so that it can just be a community of wholesalers and investors and rehabbers and just, just so they have a place to go. So uh, clearly feel the same way today that we're all just, we're all just trying to help people. Right. One of the deals I just did last week came from a, uh, somebody that would be my competition because he buys the same things. He was just out of cash. So, yep. you know, we, we all help each other. So, yeah. um, so where do you take this thing? So you start, you do 65 the first year, which is impressive. You, you adopt a staff, you probably put in processes and procedures. Yeah. What, what do you get to? So 65 start, where do you, where do you go? Uh, you know, we never really moved beyond 65 or 70 a oh. year, which we did for okay. a few years. And then, you know, things just got complicated. We kept some of those as rentals. So now we have Mm. a rental business and a fix and flip business and a wholesaling business. Then I started, um, after I'd done about 80 or hundred deals, I started coaching and mentoring other people, which for me was kind of like in my second year, basically. So, um, people were just wondering like, how are you doing this? And I started to show other people and teach other people how we do it. And, and I've always kind of, um, even today I, I did a a workshop for about a hundred people this past weekend here in Dallas. I I don't really do a lot of those anymore, but I, I, my, my kind of, uh, you know, I talk about the boring side of the business. I talk about treating it like a business Yeah, and it is, you have to, right. But that's, yeah. you know, so many other people talk about the, uh, the, the HGTV side or yeah. the, the sizzle, the sizzle side, you know, and I'm like, well, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do the work first. You can have whatever sizzle you want, but we tend to talk about the steak. So, there you go. um, yeah. So I started coaching and then as things evolved, uh, you know, life just got more complicated with more businesses and more things going on. And so, um, but, uh, yeah, so we never really got our volume above that level, but just had more things going on. Very cool. So let's yeah. talk about the coaching side. I know we're both, uh, both big on helping people, you know, start and, and you know, take the stair steps to use an earlier analogy. Um, you know, what are some of the, what are, do you just do um, flipping coaching? I'd fl- I'd probably at Flip Nerd, yes, but is that kind of the, the... Well, I mean, kind of all single family. So okay. rentals, wholesaling, and uh, rehabbing. And so you kind of find most people, most people aspire, for example, to have rentals. Yeah. But a lot of people that, that we end up working with, um, you know, you have to, we teach uh, how to put systems and processes in place and that the fuel that, kind of fuels this whole thing is, is advertising and lead generation. And so, you know, a lot of people can't keep rentals initially because they're trying to kind of build that machine out and operate the machine. And then the hope is after they have some stable level of income coming in or somewhat stable, um, that you can start to put one away. So, you know, it's hard to, if you're buying one a month to keep one every month, unless you have another source of income. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. But, uh, if you are advertising and doing wholesaling and stuff, it's like, Hey, if you buy three a month, then then you can start to say, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to flip two and I'm going to keep one or something like that. Right. So. Yeah. That's the real key to this is, um, you know, if, if, if all, if all you're doing is flipping and or wholesaling or a combination of those two, you just have a high paying job, at least a potentially high paying job, but a job nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. It's not always used my, uh, I guess I've always used my business as a way to generate revenue to and kind of either keep rentals or um, do other things that bring me recurring revenue. Exactly. Um, And so, but that's funded off of the back of of wholesaling and rehabbing typically. Yeah, no, I agree. So are you still the same ratio today? I think you shared with us kind of 40, 40, 20. 
meaning no, wholesale? I would rehab? say today, uh, honestly, the past, up until the past, I guess, maybe six months, for the past like four years, we've primarily been more of what I refer to as wholetailing. So we'll just kind of take down a house and put it pretty much directly on the MLS. Sometimes we might spend a couple thousand dollars cleaning it up or doing a few things. Sometimes we do nothing and we just list it on the MLS. So we're just kind of arbitraging the wholesale market and the retail market. And in fact, the market's been so hot. Right. And so trying to kind of wholesale houses into the retail market that might be a homeowner that are, are always willing to pay more. Yeah, of course. So now as the market started to slow down a little bit, it's still pretty strong where we're at, but it's definitely slowed down a little bit. Um, we've started to uh, do more full on rehabs again. Um, I haven't really honestly for the past five or six years assigned very many houses at all. Okay. I just make more money doing other things with them. So, well, yeah, hotel. I mean, if you can, right, that whole, I don't call it arbitrage between yeah. your marketing aspects, pulling in deals, negotiating a wholesale price, then doing, I'll call it the minimum, right? Because sometimes you got to clean it up and cut the lawn and you right. know, all that stuff. Right. Uh, that's, you know, that's where the most money's made, right? And yeah. And yeah, the market's been so hot, you know, we're, we're effectively, uh, supply is down, right? And so yes. and demand and demand where I'm at is up because there's been a massive influx of population and, and companies moving to the Dallas Fort Worth area. For sure. So we've just kind of leaned into, Hey, people are willing to take imperfect houses, even for their primary residence, because, you know, they'll fix, they'll have to fix it up themselves, but you know, we're offering them a chance to earn sweat equity. And so, yeah. um, awesome. you know, it doesn't work for, you know, where we're at, the median price point is maybe 180, 200,000. I mean, there's multi-million dollar houses here and there's $80,000 houses here. But, and so what we found is that, you know, we tend to buy first time home buyer houses. So probably median price point and below is pretty yeah. typical for us. But, and so kind of below the median is where people are, are changing their own oil and cutting their own hair and yep. earning sweat equity. And uh, you know, if we had, a, if we have a house that's three or $400,000, like, that probably isn't going to work. Those, those folks want more of a done for you yeah. uh, property. So we kind of lean into the stuff that is uh, below the median price point and, and wholesale those. Yeah. Well, that's, that's where, that's where I tell everybody to stay, frankly, right? I think any, if you're 50% above your median, especially in this changing market, yeah, you better be perfect, perfect to sell. Cause that, right. That market's right. pretty slow. And a lot of new builders are there. That's where they bring on their inventory, right? All the new builds. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're not building. I mean, in my market here and a lot of markets, builders, there's a lot of builders that don't want to build entry level houses. Anymore. No, like, you can't do it no in California. Money. I mean, they'd rather build, you know, a uh, half million, four or 500,000 and up because they can make some money on that. Right. Yeah. There's no question that the entry level build the median and below is the greatest safety and it's where you have sweat equity. It's, it's also where you can find right. problems and use creativity right? Just see the problem different like an entrepreneur should. So uh, yeah. that's, that's exactly where people should play. So yep, yep. Uh, I always ask people, where, where do you think you're taking this, uh, Mike? Where, I mean, either investor fuel or your business, look out three to five years. Where, where, is this all, where does this all go for you, you think? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I, investor fuel isn't going anywhere. I mean, it's a community of real estate investors. We have a couple groups. One is for people doing 10 to 50 deals a year. And then uh, our, that's our gold group. And our platinum group is people that are doing 50 deals a year or more. And so oh, wow. we put folks in our group that are doing three or 400 houses a year. Wow. So, um, you know, I, I, the thing is, is I've always, I'm a very social creature. I love to pull people together and I love to like say I'm a connector. You know, I've always been a connector. Hey, you need to know this guy. So, um, I've always been that person. Like even from my early teens, I, I kind of think back about stuff like, you know, in high school, I got a fake ID and I was the guy throwing parties just to bring everybody together. And I've always kind of been, I don't, sorry, mom, if you're, <laughs> I think she found out, she's already found that out and she's like, I'm not surprised. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I've always been that person that pulls people together and I think I'll always be that person. And so I think, um, um, it'll continue to be more of that community building, helping okay. other people wherever they are in their, in their kind of entrepreneurial journey, or real, usually real estate investing, um, how they can learn and advance themselves by being around other people that are like-minded. So more, probably more of that. I, I am doing a totally kind of tangent here, jumped into the multifamily game, which a lot of people are, are trying to do these days, but jumped into that late last year and 
And I, it's just a way to apply bigger investments faster. I mean, the way I've done it up until now is buying one house at a time is, is more difficult now than it was in years past. And so, um, so uh, in the market, when the market is hot from a retail standpoint, it's hard to, to forego that income for down the road. It's like, I just want to, I can, I can't believe I can sell it for that much. I, I want to take that money off the table now Yeah. and just reapply that into bigger investments that can move the needle from a wealth standpoint a lot faster. Like for me at this point, it's not, I always want today money. Don't get me wrong. I want cash in my hand, but I think much more about legacy wealth, long-term wealth building and, and residual cash flow now than, than ever before. Very, very cool. So uh, if we look out five years as investor fuel, two, three X the size, you have a, I think you said a gold and a platinum group. Do you yep. kind of titanium or I don't know what's above it or. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we, um, our platinum group, we, we are capping that. We'll probably be capped that by the end of the year. Our gold group will continue to grow. So I think, sure. you know, I think certainly uh, within the next uh, 18 months, we'll probably double in size from where we're at right now overall. Yeah. yeah and I would, in, mostly in the gold group. Yeah. I would tell, you know, people watching this, if you have any interest in making this a true business, they really need to look you up and invest your fuel, right? I've, I've uh, checked you out and members that are, are, I'm not sure which group they're in. I would, I actually don't know. I have to ask him, but they are very complimentary and, and you've changed lives and people that I would have called successful already, right? You've increased their business. Yeah. So people should really look up investor fuel and in, in what you guys are doing there. I appreciate that. And, and, and as much as I'd like to take credit for it, I mean, I'm the, I'm the ringleader, but the truth is, is like, it's just this ecosystem of people getting around each other. For sure. And I think if anything, if we owe any credit to ourselves, it's for creating a culture that is willing to be open and giving. I mean, we, we very much uh, require people to give. And if we've actually asked people to leave before that we felt we're just more of a taker. And so yeah. we kind of uh, groom that culture of wanting to share and wanting to be able to help other people. Cause you know that you just got so much help from somebody else, like totally randomly. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, you know, we could take some credit for that, but I think getting the right people in the room uh, has, has really is what's really changed lives. Managing and pruning the culture uh, is what makes masterminds and makes groups like yours. Yeah. So yeah. doing the right stuff. So if somebody wants to reach out and get a hold of you or check out Investor Fuel, how should they get a hold of you or follow you? Yeah, they can go. If they go to investorfuel.com, they can learn more about the mastermind. And of course, Flip Nerd, we have over 1,500 shows uh, on real estate investing that we've created over about five and a half years now. And so a lot of them are very similar to this kind of interview based and, uh, pulling in different experts across the industry. And so, um, but, uh, you could learn more about Flipner, just going to flipner.com and uh, we've about a hundred thousand subscribers that are kind of following along wow. watching our content and stuff. And so we've got a ton of it out there and, uh, we'd love to share it with anybody listening. Very cool, Michael, or Mike, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm glad we got to do this and keep doing Absolutely. what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. You got it.